Hey y'all, before we get started today, we just wanted to let you know that today's episode will talk about mental health, bipolar disorder, depression, stress, and anxiety. If you or a loved one needs support, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. We will be including their information and other resources for those listeners outside of the U.S. in the show notes. So... Are either of you participating in Me Made in May? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like, I'm really bad at following challenges or like any sort of structured <laughs> type yeah. of thing. Um, so like, I love looking at everybody's stuff, but I don't participate because I cannot keep up. Welcome to the Asian Sewist Collective podcast. The Asian Sewist Collective is a group of Asian people from around the world brought together by our shared appreciation for fiber and textile arts and our desire to see more Asian representation in the sewing community. In this podcast, we explore the intersection of our identities and our shared sewing practice as we create a space for Asian sewists and our allies. I'm your co-host, Ada Chen, and I'm recording from Denver, Colorado, which is the traditional territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. I'm a marketer turned entrepreneur, and these days you'll find me running my own all-natural skincare business called Chuan Skincare, C-H-U-A-N, and sharing my marketing tips on my blog, The Cultivate Method. Most importantly for this podcast, you can find my sewing account on Instagram at i.hope.so. And I'm your co-host, Nicole. I'm based out of Chicago, Illinois, the original homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, and the Odawa people. I'm a Philippinex American woman, a lawyer by day, and a sewing enthusiast the rest of the time. You can find me on Instagram at Nicole Angeline Sews. So before we dive into this week's episode, Nicole, can you tell us about your current sewing project? Yeah, I'm, uh, I talked about this last week. I'm still chugging along on my Filipino flag inspired make. Um, I got the pants and they're turning out all right. Um, I'm making the Florence trouser from Size Me Sewing in a red crepe from Fabric Mart. Uh, I said last week I've never made pants pants before. So it's been interesting. Um, I've also really struggled with ready to wear pants anyway, the way that my body is built. Of course, ready to wear is not built for everybody. So Basically, when leggings became a thing, this was life-changing for me, but I'm trying <laughs> to do pants again, and uh, so we'll see how it goes. How about you, Ada? I believe in you and your pants, and Thank you. Once, you get to, once you get your pants fitting done, like, I mean, your body will change, but you've <laughs> nailed pants. Um, I am finally going to finish the Black Poly Chiffon Wilder Gown by Friday Pattern Company that I started ages ago, but because it is Black Poly Chiffon, I got a little annoyed, so I put it down for a bit so I could come back to it and uh, maybe have some fresh perspective for uh, finishing it. And I realized I may or may not like it, so I already pre-asked my sister if I don't like it, if she would want it. Um, In the meantime, I actually did get a new machine or a new to me machine. So I I happened to be at a local secondhand craft store and found a really good deal on a vintage Bernina from the 80s. And I think when I messaged you, Nicole, because we'd been talking about machine upgrades and fabric bands, you were like, well, I'm not going to tell you not to get it. And lo and behold, I went home on a Tuesday with a new machine. (laughs) If you ever uh, want me to stop you from buying something, like you have to prompt (laughs) me ahead of time and say, Nicole, we're doing this fabric and patterns band. But Whoa. you didn't say machines. I'm like, yeah, go for it. <laughs> the good news is I did, when I brought it home, then I had four machines. And so I did manage to actually sell my trusty basic Janome um, to another beginner sewer or sewist in the area. So that was very exciting. And we bonded over um, our local craft store, Fancy Tiger. And <laughs> I showed her how to thread and prep the machine for everything. So I trust that it's in good hands. And now I'm down to three machines and hopefully soon two, because that'll be a little more manageable in my space. Nice. So thanks to everyone for all the feedback on our debut episode. Cultural appropriation is a really big topic, and we only scratched the surface last week. Remember, we're also going to be expanding on the topic for episode six, and we're going to try to address any listener questions that have come in. So if you have any um, email us, shoot us a direct message on Instagram, and we'll try to get to them. 
Also, don't forget to check out the show notes for a lot of really great information that um, our resources and members of the collective put together for you all. Now, also for today's topic, be sure to check out the show notes. Basically, the show notes are something to check out after every episode. Um, We've got uh, links to all the info that we're going to be talking about today, as well as additional resources that might be helpful for you or people you know. With that, let's dive in. In the U.S., Mental Health Awareness Month is celebrated in May, and data collected from the National Latino and Asian American Study in 2010 found that Asian Americans have a 17.3% overall lifetime rate of any psychiatric disorder and a 9.19% 12-month rate. Yet, at the same time, Asian Americans are three times less likely to seek mental health services than white people. And according to a University of Maryland School of Public Health study, several common sources of stress that affect overall mental health in the Asian American community are parental pressure to succeed in academics, family obligations based on strong traditional and cultural values, discrimination due to racial or cultural background, and difficulty balancing between two different cultures and developing a bicultural sense of self. The same study found that participants reported feeling pressure to live up to the model minority myth. The model minority myth is the idea that Asians are able to rise to quote-unquote honorary white status through assimilation, hard work, and intelligence. This myth is used to drive a wedge between Asian communities and other communities of color, specifically Black communities. And the way that it's used against other communities of color is that it's basically held up against them like well, if the Asians can do it, like, why aren't you doing it? Or you must be lazy or undeserving or a problem. And the perpetuation of the model minority myth and the stereotypes around it, I'm looking at you, Andrew Yang, and your I'm good at math slogan, support a perception that Asian Americans and Asian Canadians don't need support, which means the very programs that support our communities are largely overlooked, ignored, and underfunded. In addition, the myth is so pervasive that many of our communities have bought into it, hence the pressure to live up to it. But the myth is a myth. It's false. Poverty rates among Hmong, Bangladeshi, and other Asian ethnic groups are the same as African Americans. A 2020 study also found that across the country, nearly 1.1 million Southeast Asian Americans are low income and about 460,000, 100,000 live in poverty. And that's just one subset of Asian Americans. There's a lot more to unpack here. And we've got links in the show notes for you to learn more about the model minority myth. Absolutely. The model minority myth is both both pervasive and complex, and it's just one aspect of this Maryland study that we were talking about. But to circle back, the last takeaway from this study that I did want to share is that participants reported that discussing mental health concerns is considered taboo in many Asian cultures, and as a result, Asian Americans tend to dismiss, deny, or neglect their symptoms. There have been similar findings in Asian communities across the diaspora. For example, In 2015, a district school board study conducted in Toronto, Canada, it was found that individuals of Asian origin showed greater levels of depression stigma compared to individuals of European origin. So according to that study, the perception of social norms, the belief that depression brings shame to one's family, a social dominance orientation, and conservative values mediated the relationship between ethnicity and depression stigma. Now, I do want to emphasize that every Asian person's personal perspective and experience is going to be different. This information was collected through academic study of a specific set of Asian folks. So there's that disclaimer. But I would venture to guess that, like me, some of our listeners can immediately identify with at least one of the bullet points that we just talked about. So that's some background on mental health in the Asian community. And while we do believe that many of the aspects about mental health in the Asian community that we are going to discuss today are relatable to many members of the Asian diaspora, I do want to acknowledge that our discussion today is going to be very U.S.-centric, and Mental Health Awareness Month is celebrated in the U.S., and our guest Angelica, Nicole, and I all live in the States. And so with that, let's go ahead and introduce our guest for this week. 
We are welcoming Filipino American seamstress, pattern designer, fiber artist, and DIY maker Angelica from Angelica Creates. Angelica is also an avid mental health advocate in the sewing community who recently hosted a 12 hour, 12 hour making marathon to raise awareness for World Bipolar Day and as a fundraiser for four mental health charities. We're going to chat with her about her sewing experience, being a mental health advocate within the sewing community and a member of the Asian community, as well as the launch, very exciting, of her first pattern, the Melanie Wrap Skirt. Welcome, Angelica. Thank you. So um, we would love to know, can you start off by talking a little bit about your identity? Sure. Yeah. So I am a Filipino American. My parents were both born in the Philippines. Um, and so I was born here. Um, my parents were both born in the Philippines. Um, my dad, um, back during like the Vietnam era joined the U S Navy, um, from the Philippines. And so that was kind of his like opportunity and pathway to like kind of, you know, take it, take it an opportunity to come out of poverty and uh, come to America and seize the opportunity that is here, um, that many people come to America for. Um, and so he joined the U S Navy. He served, um, over 20 years, um, and retired from the Navy. Um, he married my mom, and, um, sh- and she moved here, um, once my dad was retired and then, um, and then I was born like a year later. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I would, I guess I would, um, identify as like Filipino American just cause like, you know, I'm, I'm full Filipino, um, but you know, grew up in America. And so, um, the blending of those two cultures I identify with. Would you like to share a little bit about your day job? Uh, sure. Um, so I am a senior finance analyst at a paper company, not Dunder Mifflin. <laughs> um, so no, I do not work with Jim or Pam, um, which is always funny when I tell people that. I just have to preface with it because people are like always like, oh, like Dunder Mifflin? <laughs> no, <laughs> we don't make that kind of paper. Um but yeah, I am a senior finance analyst. I went the business route. And so that's what I did. Um, it's a good job. Um, yeah, it keeps me on my toes every day. Um, but yeah, it, it is very technical and numbers oriented. And so being able to have a creative outlet to come home to is nice. Totally. I can definitely understand that. And so the creative outlet, at least one of them is sewing, right? Mm -hmm. So how long have you been sewing and how did you get started? So I officially learned to sew in 2017. Um, My husband actually taught me how to sew because he, where he grew grew up, like home ec was still a thing. And so, yeah, he taught me just like how to work like the basics of my sewing machine. Um, I actually am like a knitter crocheter first. Um, and so like primarily up to then I was knitting a lot. I got to a point where I was like knitting sweaters and stuff and I'm like, this takes too long. (laughs) And so, (laughs) and so I, um, was like, you know, like if I want to like make my clothes, maybe I should, maybe I should pick up sewing. And so I did. Um, and then also just being like short, um, and like just being frustrated with ready to wear just in like, you know, my figure, not only being short, but also like, I'm like super muscular. And so I just always had a really hard time, like finding clothes that just fit me like right off the rack. Um, and I'm like, I can just learn how to alter my own clothes. Um, and so those two things were kind of like the motivation for me to start. And so, yeah, I learned in 2017 And then I didn't really touch my machine for a year after that, other than making like fabric coasters because it was easy. (laughs) And then um, in like summer of 2018, I picked it up again because my husband and I started going to Renaissance fairs. And I was like, well, I really want to like make an outfit. Like I don't want to buy one. I feel like it would be fun to make one. And so 
like as practice, I made like an apron, which is like everyone's usual first project. Um, and then after that, I was like, okay, I think I got the hang of it. And then I made a Renaissance fair outfit, which I still have. And it's just like frayed seams all over the place. <laughs> Doesn't fit me very well, but I make do. Um, and yeah, I've been sewing ever since then. Is that on your grid? My Renaissance Fair outfit? Yeah. Um, I think like you got to scroll a ways. I want to see it. It's on there. So yeah, I, will. I can. I can. Maybe I'll repost it as like a throwback. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll find it and put it in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you still sew? renaissance costumes or what types of projects do you like to sew now i haven't sewn any like renaissance costumes just because we have not i mean covid like there haven't been any renaissance fairs and i've thought about making a new one now that i'm like a little bit more skilled mostly i sew garments and like i really enjoy like tops and dresses um really like sewing my own active wear lounge wear I'm about to jump into lingerie sewing. Haven't done it yet, so I'm excited about that. And occasionally I will sew like accessories or home decor items as needed or like practical items if my husband needs something for hunting or <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Beyond coasters now. <laughs> yes. So where do you get your inspiration for sewing? The sewing community is awesome. Like I get a lot of inspiration there, especially on Instagram. Like I don't know how many things I have in like my saved. Oh yeah. (laughs) Like, yeah. And you know how you can save people's posts. So I have so many of those like, and I just like, I can't look at these right now because I have so many projects, but (laughs) very inspired by everyone. And um, I also enjoy looking at like fashion in like shows tv shows that i watch um i don't know if you've watched schitt's creek but i just um, started it's so good (laughs) Uh, but um alexis who's the sister in it her clothes are amazing um and so i love her style uh admit that i watch riverdale which some people make fun of me for because it's like a teeny show or i don't know but i watched riverdale and um Betty Cooper's style is like amazing, like very uh, preppy and like chic. um, And I love it. And then also like celebrity fashion. Jennifer Aniston has always been like my style icon because she's very casual chic. Um, Like she makes a white t-shirt and jeans just look so good. And also Jennifer Lawrence, like I think her style is also fairly similar, but like when she glams it up, she glams it up in like a not completely like out there, you know, like yeah. look. It's very like simple and um and I love that. So I would say like those three things. Oh, and Pinterest, of course. <laughs> now that you say it, like I've been following you for a while and now that you say like Alexis from Shits Creek and then both Jennifer's and and all of that. I it kind of it makes sense now. I was like trying to pinpoint your style because I think there are some things that we share between your grid and like what I want to make or what I currently own. And mm-hmm. I was like, I don't know what the words are, but like that's basically it. If you were to describe it, and I too have many posts saved in Instagram. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Your handle on Instagram and your blog are called Angelica Creates, right? So Mm -hmm. can you tell our listeners about what the focus of your blog is? Angelica Creates, I came up with because like I didn't want to be pigeonholed into like sewing or this or that. And I've just always like picked up different creative things like mostly in like fiber arts and like sewing I I like to keep it pretty broad so that it like gives me room to share other things but I do mostly sew and share sewing content and things that I make and um and so you'll see that on my blog too with the occasional knitting project or whatnot my tagline for my blog or brand I guess is make share inspire so you know, just, I like to share things that I've created to hopefully inspire others to like, sew that pattern or sew something like that. Um, or, 
even just like if you're a non-sewer and you happen to follow me, it inspires you to take up sewing. And so that's kind of my goal. So you are a self-described mental health advocate. Now, what does this mean and why is it important to you? I am very pro talking about mental health and pro um, like education around mental health um, and just like being transparent about it. And so it's really important to me because I have lived with some level of mental health condition for almost my whole life. Um, and for most of my whole life, like I didn't know, like you mentioned in the, the beginning and in the introduction, like it's very taboo in Asian communities and you just, which I'll get into later, like talking about some of those like um, issues. It's not really something that's talked about. And so never really, it never just really crossed my mind or my family's mind just because that's how we have been conditioned. And um, in the summer of 2019, I was diagnosed with a bipolar two disorder um, and ADD. And like, I had a really, um, I had like a deep depressive episode in um, summer of 2019. And I was like, okay, like I obviously this is like, it it just got worse as I got older, which is very common. Um, And with bipolar disorder, most people don't get diagnosed until like their mid twenties, mid to late twenties. And so like I followed that exact trajectory. And, and so, yeah, I got to a point where it was really bad and I was like, okay, like I need help. And so I, um, I seeked it out and I was diagnosed. Um, and ever since then, like, I've just, it's been really great because knowing, you know, exactly what is going on with me has been very, um, empowering because I know exactly how to care for myself now. And my life is like, a thousand times better now because of it. And um, it's important for me to talk openly about these things, especially being Asian, because, you know, I don't want anyone to like experience symptoms for so long without being diagnosed. Um, And like I said, my quality of life has improved. And like, to me, just being candid about it, it's like, I don't like, it's, it's only a part of me. Like I don't identify myself. Like I am this or I am that, like I am bipolar, but it's still important for me to talk about because, um, like I just want to let it out in the open and not hide it because that just causes more stress and anxiety when you feel like you need to hide what's going on with you from other people. And also like if somebody has a problem with the fact that that's part of me, then, like, I don't need that negative energy in my life. So <laughs> yes. yeah, <laughs> true. I am, I am open about it. Also like just normalizing the conversation, I think over the years, um, you know, like celebrities and just people in general over the internet are, you know, being more open about it. And, um, as much as I'm like, it, it's hard that so many people do, um, deal with like mental health conditions. Um, it's also good that people are talking more openly about it Um, because like if we just normalize the conversation around it, then people won't see a diagnosis as being bad or like that they are now officially a quote, quote, crazy person or something like that, you know? And so just knowledge is power for everyone. So when I learned about this aspect of, of your work and, and, and who you are in terms of being a mental health advocate, that really spoke to me. Um, I definitely, being a, an Asian woman and growing up in a household with, you know, first generation or also my grandparents, it's mental health wasn't prioritized. And, you know, it's not, it's not that they're bad, you know, it's just, it's just mm-hmm. part of our culture. And so just in the spirit of destigmatizing mental health, I have also uh, about six years ago was diagnosed with depression and about two years ago was diagnosed with anxiety. Mm-hmm. And I try to be honest. I, I try to be honest about it, particularly in social media. Like I'll disappear for a little bit or if I'm feeling upset about something and, and it feels right to share, you know, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll share it because I do believe that sometimes when it's hard for me to, to even talk about it. I, I try to do it f- 
for the sake of normalizing. And so when I, when I found your profile and I saw that you shared this way, it really resonated with me. So thank you for being that mental health advocate. You give me bravery and, uh, you know, all that to, to, uh, take with. So I really appreciate that uh, from you. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. And like there, there's some days where I just like <laughs> the anxiety kicks in and I'm just like, oh, why am I doing this? Like what? And I keep telling myself like when I was getting diagnosed and just like reading other people's stories, it's like, well, that helped me. So for me, it's just like paying it forward um, because I don't know who's going to come across what I have to say but maybe it'll help them. Um, and sometimes like I do have anxiety about like being so open or whatever, but um, I mean, you know, people are open about like other like health ailments and, you know, just because you can't see mental health conditions, like, you know, sometimes like that's another thing that makes it difficult sometimes. Yeah, totally. And I think part of normalizing it is like, by you setting an example and sharing your story, like other people who may not have those words because they either didn't grow up, you know, being exposed to the concept or the term mental health, right, can actually are, are more empowered by hearing that and starting to understand and recognize, you know, when they should seek help. And I think that's mm-hmm. that's just super important. Um So I would love to know, you did kind of touch on it before, what are some mental health concepts um, that are unique in Asian communities that you've seen? So I think that with like various mental health conditions, like depression or ADD, like it can be interpreted to other people around them, especially in the Asian community as like a character flaw or that Like, you just need to stop being lazy, work harder. Like, why don't you be more like so-and-so? Which, you know, I I hear a lot. um, Like, I'm very thankful that I personally didn't hear a lot of that. But, like, I have heard other friends, parents say stuff like that. Like, it's not real. And you're just lazy. and, And you just need to, like, work harder and suck it up. And I think, too, with, like, ADD, ADHD, there just in society in general, like there's this, and I'm speaking about these things because like I know about them personally. So I'm sure with other like mental health conditions, there are other like nuances with them, but like, and for just for example, like ADD or ADHD, like I feel like society in general associates those conditions with people who are just like troublemakers or like all over the place, can't sit still, bad at like, you know, bad grades and that kind of stuff. And like, you would never think that, like, especially in Asian culture, because we are taught to be like law abiding or just very like, we're just taught to like be well behaved and like, don't cause a scene, like be quiet and, Mm -hmm. and sit still, like don't bring attention to yourself. And so like, I was like, well, I have good grades. Like I'm not causing trouble at school. Like, I don't think that, you know, this is something that I struggle with, but like, I also struggled with like reading in school because like, I would like read a paragraph like 10 times. And like, sometimes it still just would not like stick in my brain or like, um, just like, I was always very like hyperactive, like always doing extracurriculars and people just thought like, oh, she's so ambitious. Like, look at her doing all this stuff. But as I got into my like adult life, um, you know, there are other areas of my life that started affecting. You just don't know until you see somebody like a professional and talk to them about it. Um, and so, yeah, there, there's just like those character things that um, like character flaw that people will in Asian communities might associate that with. I think you mentioned earlier too, like bringing dishonor to your family or like tainting your like family name. Um, like having some sort of label of a diagnosis um, like might bring shame to your family or just the fear of failure, like having to like really push through depression, like through college and things like that, because like you had no room to fail. And so um, like, and if you failed, then that would bring like shame to your family and it would just, yeah, not be good. And, um, so I think that's another thing. Um, 
which kind of goes along with like repressing emotions, like mm-hmm. just stay focused in your education and career. Um, I think it all is like a, a web that just like kind of all goes together. Um, and then also like the last thing that I have here in my notes is just like guilt, um, especially for those with immigrant parents, I think. Um, like you have this guilt, like I shouldn't feel like this. I don't deserve to feel like this. Like my family made a lot of sacrifices to provide for me and our family and they came here. Like they escaped, like, you know, maybe they, you know, escaped from a life that was not good and came to America. And um, so I just need to suck it up. Like, this isn't that bad. Like they probably went through a lot harder stuff. Um, And so I think there's a lot of guilt involved too. Yeah, I think I've I've chatted with a few friends about this and it's like even once you have a diagnosis, like you're a lot of the times I think a lot of families want you to like keep it secret because they don't want you to bring that shame or that guilt or they don't want to feel like mm-hmm. if they want they don't want other people feeling sorry for you or sorry for them, but really like there is nothing to feel sorry for because there's it's not your fault. <laughs> like, yeah. Like it, it, it happens. Um, and I think a lot more people have mental health illness than we normally like kind of acknowledge. Yeah, for sure. I think that in Asian communities, like people definitely are starting to talk about it more. And, um, I don't know if you, um, know Joe Coy, um, or a fan of Joe Coy, but he's a Filipino, American comedian. And I just read his um, book that came out, Mixed Plate. And he, he, yeah, it's amazing. If you have to read the audio book because he narrates it and does Uh all the accents. Yes. But, um, you know, he he, um, opened up about like his uh, brother having schizophrenia. And it's like, you know, it, it, and like, yeah, to me, it was just like, yeah, like people need to open up about this more. Um, because I feel like a lot of Asian families or in Asian culture, people think like, no, this can't happen to us or whatever, but, um, it can happen to anyone. Our mental health conditions do not discriminate. Everything that you said and the things that you touched on, guilt, shame, I resonated hard with me. (laughs) Um, I think in my mental health journey and, you know, while we started the episode by saying everyone's journey is personal, it also is really amazing to see these common threads that we all experience, Mm -hmm. you know, at least, you know, as we're discussing it today as part of our Asian identity that feeds into our separate but related, you know, um, mental health illnesses. As you were talking, I was just sitting here, just like, yes, yes, all of these things. Yeah. Um, On March 27th, you held a Makers Marathon event to raise funds for mental health-focused organizations. Can you tell us a little bit more about this event and why you decided to do the marathon event? Yeah. So World Bipolar Day is on March 30 every year. It falls on Vincent Van Gogh's birthday. People have posthumously, is that the right word, (laughs) diagnosed him with um, bipolar disorder. And so like that's why it's on March 30th. And on March 27th, yeah, I did a 12 hour making marathon. Um, and I've been thinking about doing something for World Bipolar Day for like a year now. Um, and like, how can I tie like making and, and that in while also like raising money and raising awareness? Um, so I was like, well, I'm just going to do it. And, um, I don't know how it's going to go. I don't, 100% know what I'm doing, but I'm going to tell people I'm doing it and I'm going to do it. (laughs) And so that's what I did. Um, And yeah, I spent 12 hours on a Saturday um, just working on some uh, creative projects. And it wasn't just sewing. Like I was working on this like macrame project um, for like some decorations for my sewing room. And um, so I worked on like a lot of different things. um, But throughout the day, like I went live on Instagram and discussed um, like mental health and also the organizations that I was donating to dedicated to mental health. Um, So the four organizations that I chose, um, it was really important for me to donate to BIPOC mental health organizations um, because as you mentioned earlier, like very underfunded. And so 
I donated to the Loveland Foundation, which provides therapy and resources primarily for Black women. Um, Asian Mental Health Collective, which is, uh, you know, mental health resources for the Asian community. And then Latinx Therapy, which provides therapy and resources for the Latinx community. And then I also donated to the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance. Um, I'm a member of their Young Adult Council as of recently. And um, a lot of great resources there that helped me out when I was um, going through like my experience and being diagnosed and trying to find some help and resources. So those were the four organizations that I cho- chose. I rose eight or I, I rose, I raised $880 <laughs> um, and I split that out equally to um, each of the organizations. So I was very happy with the results of that. I think I remember seeing your post, but when you were promoting it like the week before and I was like 50 bucks, Asian mental health collective mm-hmm. group, here you go. And I was like, like immediately just like, this is great. I love this. Um, so I'm sure there are at least, you know, a few others who are also donating to all those great organizations. Um, I'm curious on the day of, you said you did quite a few projects. So what was it like actually making for 12 hours? Straight? Oh yeah. Well, by the end of the day, I was like so tired. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I need a break. Actually, um, like <laughs> it not only was like, um, tiring like throughout the day, but it actually like affected me for a whole week, which is pretty common. Like I get exhausted very easily. Um, and so like for a whole week, I I did not touch anything, but, um, yeah, I just like, I had to work very carefully because I'm like very prone to making mistakes and I like really suck at reading instructions. And so I was like, okay, I have to like, if I'm going to do this for 12 hours, I have to like really focus, like drink some coffee. Um, and yeah, like I ended up only making like one workout top and then like I finished my macrame, um, wall hanging, which took, um, quite a while, but that's fine that like, I only worked on two projects because I also spent a lot of like half that time talking about mental health in my stories or my Instagram live and, and stories. And so, um, that was like, that was also, you know, very important. So, yeah. You say only, and I say, <laughs> wow, that's still a lot. So yeah, I popped in as well um, to check, to check in. And I don't think even in 12 hours, I could probably sit and do one thing because I do things in a chunk. So I admire your stamina, despite how draining it was uh, for the sake of these four organizations. So I love that. Do you think you'll be doing it again next year? I would like to, I would definitely like to get more people involved and like kind of make it more of a thing. So I don't know how I'm going to do that, <laughs> but maybe we should work on that. <laughs> maybe we could promote yeah. it again on the podcast. Yeah. Um, we'll so yeah, I would like to do, um, do it again. Not, not even just for like world bipolar day, maybe find another time that, um, you know, captures like all mental health, um, and, do it then like maybe May next year for mental health month. I think October is world mental health day. So mm-hmm. Maybe that's too soon for 12, <laughs> for a 12 hour, <laughs> make a but lots of opportunities though. Yes, absolutely. So what would you say to an Asian person who may feel like they need assistance, but are afraid to speak out themselves? I think first, just because this is really important. This goes for anyone. If you feel like you aren't in danger to yourself, please call a hotline, seek a hotline, go to the hospital. There's no shame in that. Get immediate help if you are, if you are struggling immediately. As far as, um, for the Asian community, um, I think like one thing that help that could help is like, it's very easy to think you have to go like, all or nothing as far as telling people. Um, like if you tell somebody, you have to tell everyone or, you know, that kind of mindset. Don't think about having to tell everyone right away. Um, like if you have somebody in your family or friend circle that you feel comfortable with and trust, um, like find somebody because that person can then check in on you, make sure you're doing okay. Who knows? Maybe, you know, they might have experienced 
that before or might, you know, be able to point you in the right direction. I think it's, it is really important for like somebody at least in your circle to know um, that you aren't feeling optimal and that they can help you out um, and kind of field other people, (laughs) I guess. Um, Because like for me personally, like, you know, whenever I was like experiencing depression and just not doing okay, like before I was diagnosed and didn't know how to communicate, I would just lie to people. Like I would lie to people. Like my one go-to lie was always, I have a migraine because nobody will question that Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you have a migraine, you can do anything. (laughs) And so that was like my number one lie that I went to. But if you have somebody in your circle that knows you aren't feeling okay, then that, you know, that can also provide cushion. Like if you're having anxiety about telling other people that you're not feeling okay, then maybe that person be like, yeah, I just, you know, don't, I don't think that we can do that or like, you know, especially with friends that are, that are wanting to hang out. Um, that's also really hard. And then I think another piece of advice is like, if you need to tell somebody in your family that might not understand like mental health, I, I have learned that taking an information and fact-based approach with it has been very um, useful mm-hmm. um, because I think, you know, in Asian culture, like the repression of emotions is very um, common. And so it's hard sometimes to empathize with the emotions of other people if you are personally repressing your own emotions. Yeah. And um, so if you take things from like a fact-based science, like informational approach, um, that helps. Um, you know, it, it could be something like, this is what I'm experiencing. Like my brain kept chemicals in my brain are off balance or, you know, whatever is, you know, whatever the actual scientific thing that's going on. Like, um, like, you know, my chemicals are balanced and I need help to treat them. Like throwing in the science seems to help a little bit because people can then relate to that. Like, oh, that's like being a diabetic and your insulin being off or, you know, so you can kind of relate things to that. I guess like the next step, if you don't feel comfortable telling somebody in your family or friends, um, like if you really just have a lot of like fear and anxiety around that, like if you have the means to do so, like definitely seek out a therapist. You can even talk to your primary care provider. Um, This is something like I had a meeting with my um, depression bipolar support Alliance, young adult council. And they were like, you know, I always tell people like, go to your primary care provider, which people don't think about, but they can then point you to the resources if you don't know where to start. And a lot of hospitals also have like a behavioral health um, department. And then I think lastly, if you're not in a position to seek therapy, you can go to websites of organizations that are dedicated to mental health. Um, I recommend the National Alliance on Mental Illness, um, which covers a lot of um, various mental health conditions or the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance. Um, Those organizations I know have like peer-to-peer type support, or there are also local chapter meetings to talk with others who also have like lived experience with mental health conditions. Um, And, you know, it just depends on your comfort level, but those are available for free. That would be my recommendation. Those are all great resources. I wanted to share that um, I think for many of us, especially women of color, we need to advocate for ourselves, especially in the U.S. healthcare system too. Um, I personally went to my primary care physician and asked for a referral and had told her a little bit of what I was going through. And she actually just dismissed me. And this was another woman of color. And so I think we have to remember that doctors are humans too. And sometimes they are subject to biases and may not necessarily be giving us everything that we need. And if someone tells you no like that, and you know something is wrong, you are going to be the only person who can advocate for your own mental health and seek the resources that you need. I do want to add um, one note about like seek seeking out your primary care provider, like you kind of telling your experience with that, um, 
like one women's health, another topic, but like women's health, very, um, very shoved off to the side. I've had my fair share of having to like march into my doctor and be very like stern about what I needed. Um, but yeah, like your health, you are in control of your health. And I feel like some primary care providers like will just prescribe you an antidepressant or like even urgent care. Like, and if you like immediately feel like you need it, like, I mean, make your choice on what you feel like you need in that moment. But if you are hesitant to take medication or, you know, like tell them that, like, don't feel obligated to take the meds because they're providing it to you. Um, you can say, no, I don't feel like that's what I need at the time, especially if you're going through a difficult time, like tell them, I don't feel like I need that. I feel like I just, I need a therapist to support me or like, just tell them exactly what you feel like you need at the time. Or like, I would prefer to be referred to a psychiatrist because psychiatrists know and are fully educated on the various different mental health conditions in more in like in depth in comparison to a primary care provider they will better know which medication will work for you um there sometimes is just like this blanket medication that people will um prescribe to everybody and um yeah and so that is my addition to the primary care provider recommendation that all of that advice is great. And I hope our listeners really um, take that to heart. I wanted to end our conversation talking a little bit more about you and the launch of your first pattern, the Melanie wrap skirt. Can you tell us more about what the process of making your own pattern was like? Yeah. Um, so I just uh, generally winged it. Um, I had, <laughs> will be 100% honest. Like I, um, yeah, I like winged a lot of it because I have been wanting to make patterns for a while, like mostly because it came from like personal like gaps as well. Like I had some ideas of patterns that I wanted to create because I haven't come across like that perfect one for myself. So like, you know, I had been working on like some concepts of um, different patterns um, and, you know, testing out different like samples and whatnot. Um, so I worked with the pattern drafter and grader, um, to create the pattern in the size range. And I worked on creating the instructions and everything else, um, as far as like construction of the skirt and, um, like for my artwork, like I commissioned some of my artsy pals. This is going to sound so, <laughs> this is going to sound so nerdy, but I commissioned some of my like art friends in my final fantasy 14 gaming group. <laughs> Because there's a lot of um if you very, can draw Final Fantasy stuff, you yeah. Can, you can draw. Yeah. Very well. Um lots of talented artists in my like group. Yeah, I um I just wanted to add like some fun artwork to it, like rather than like the typical line art or like technical sketch. Um so I kind of went with like an anime style art because that's just like me and who I am. And so just throwing in those elements too. But yeah, so that's like kind of how I put it together and it's, it was a fun learning experience. I'm like very excited to put out more patterns and, um, hopefully, you know, they also are what other people are looking for. So, yeah. What was your biggest lesson learned out of this experience? For sure. Like patterns take a lot of work to create, um, like mad respect for everybody that, that creates patterns, uh, for others because, um, yeah, it, it does take a lot of work and effort. Um, and another thing that I, you know, just had to tell myself is like, nothing has to be perfect from the get go. You know, I like receive emails from pattern companies that I have sewn from and they send out revisions, like, you know, like not letting perfection get to your head. Um, and also like learning not to force my creativity. Um, like thankfully I have a full-time job. So um, I can take the time I need to like build my patterns out and um, make sure that I'm in the right like headspace to do so. Um, but if I like force myself like, okay, today for two hours, I'm going to like work on these instructions or whatever. And the same goes for like even my own sewing practice. Like I feel like if I push it, then it stops being fun. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to learn 
that as well, especially when you like bring in like the business aspect to it, like that can ruin it for a lot of people. <laughs> and I, d- I didn't want to ruin it. Like I really do enjoy like what I'm doing and I enjoy all aspects of sewing. Um, and so I didn't want to like let my mindset get in the way. And I think like part of that is like, I kind of like drew inspiration on that from like some of my like favorite musicians like they don't force the their themselves to create music like if they're not ready to put an album out or like don't want to release a song like they won't they will wait um like I've been waiting for like one of my favorite like artists to drop an album for like and she's been working on her album for like two years um and so like it's like people's creative processes are different I respect that very cool. Well, we are looking forward to whatever you have uh, coming up next for the sewing community. Thank you so much for joining us today, Angelica. It was a really great pleasure to speak with you. Um, can you tell our listeners where we can find your work? Yeah. Um, so my blog is where all my makes are, uh, which is angelicacreates.com. Uh, my patterns and store um, currently is on Etsy, which is etsy.com slash shop slash shop Angelica Creates. And then um, I am frequently on Instagram, like as far as like socially. And so send me a DM or you can chat with me on Instagram um, at Angelica underscore creates. Thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode of the Asian Sewist Collective podcast. Next week, we'll be speaking with Nandita from at Dita Divine on Instagram about pattern testing. In our other upcoming episodes, we have special guests talking about all sorts of topics like quilting, bag making, and even some fabric history and garment history. If you like our show, you can support us by following us on Instagram at Asian Sewist Collective. That's one word, Asian Sewist Collective. And you can spread the word and tell your friends. We would also really appreciate it if you could rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcast, Pocket Cast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. As we mentioned before, all of the links and resources that we mentioned in today's episode will be in the show notes on our website at AsianSewistCollective.com. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us with your questions, comments, or even voice messages if you'd like to be featured on a future episode at AsianSewistCollective at gmail.com. This episode was brought to you by your co-hosts, Ada Chen and Nicole Angeline. The topics we covered were researched by Eileen Lung. This episode was produced by me, Nicole Angeline, and edited by Leslie Reem Hunt. Thank you so much to the other members of our collective who made this week's episode a reality. This is the Asian Sewist Collective Podcast, and we'll see you next week. If you're struggling with your mental health, know that seeking help is a strength and not a weakness. If you or someone you care about needs help, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. It's a free, confidential, and 24-7 support line for people in distress. They offer prevention and crisis resources for you or your loved ones and best practices for professionals. We are going to include a link to their website and the phone number again in our show notes, and we'll include resources for those of you who are outside of the U.S. as well.